Ladies. Oh, ladies. La <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 113. 100 and, 100 and something of the Spear and Sunnies podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. And I'm actually really hot in this room. I don't know why. Ah, fuck. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to adjust the temperature of the room on the thermostat here, okay? Because, you know, there are no dads here, so you're allowed to do that without him going, Hey, don't touch the thermostat! But I realize I should have... Oh, really, I should be starting the podcast again and just... I mean, this is a horrendous start, isn't it? I First of all, I went, Ladies! And that's not very nice to listen to. And then I continued on. And then I was like, you know what? I've been sitting here for about 15 minutes, really hot, and I'm only going to decide to change the temperature when I've begun recording. So really, guys, this start of the podcast is more of a write-off than anything. So I don't have anything funny to say about this. So I'm going to change the thermostat. <laughs> All right. What is it? 24? That's way too hot. It's going to be... Guys, I'm going to set it at 20. 20 degrees. I'm coming back now. All right. Let's get into the podcast. Okay, so, how have you guys been? You, you been alright? Hey? Have you been getting into the royal wedding? Oh, I'm so fucking glad it's over. Shut up! Dude, have you met one, one person? One, have you met one person that's actually like, geez, love the royal wedding? You haven't. You haven't. It's not, and your mum doesn't count, okay? Actually, my mum didn't even fucking care about it until the day of. You know what? You're allowed to, to care about the day of the wedding. On the day, you can have it on TV, but you're not, you can't watch it. You have it on in the background. You don't sit there and fucking watch it. Oh, my whole family. I got home with jazz like late. I don't know, not late, like 8 p.m. And it was just on the fucking TV. And oh man, it was the worst. My mum was there, my grandma was there, my dad was there, and they were just watching someone else's wedding. Could you think of anything more fucking boring? I've been to a wedding of people that I know and they suck. And not only is it someone else's wedding, it's someone you've never met, someone you will never meet, and it's not one of those fun weddings. You know, I think people have got have people have got it now. They understand that weddings suck and they're boring, and they know that they're not that fucking special because everyone on the planet does it. Except for you lonely virgins out there. I know you're listening. <laughs> um, but that that's what I mean. Like it's it's one of those fucking boring traditional weddings oh, i'm still so hot i gotta take my jacket off why did i why did i just take my jacket off before i changed the thermostat that would have been smarter all right it's gonna be one of those episodes guys where i just don't i just don't show you any respect where i'm like ah oh, i'm just gonna do other stuff and and attend to myself while i also half ass the first 10 minutes of the podcast it's just gonna be one of those i'm sorry what do you want from me it's free <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's one of those fucking boring traditional weddings where they have to follow the rules and do this and sing that song and have this fucking 10 year old sing this because his balls haven't dropped yet. Like, man, I reckon I was, I got home at 8 PM. Uh, what was the duration of it? I reckon the whole thing went for about six hours. How long was the Royal wedding? Like from the start to the end. How long was the word? As if you can't Google that. Oh, here we go. Schedule. All right. We had to figure it out from a schedule, right? So if your wedding has a schedule, it sucks. It sucks. This is my this is my wedding. All right. Small church, or it doesn't have to be a church. Small venue. Fucking my mum, my dad, her mum, her dad. Six friends each, in the door. Kiss out. Done! I don't want to fucking hang around. And she doesn't get a veil. No, she can have a veil, but she doesn't get a fucking train. I don't care how hot she is, she doesn't get a fucking train. If you have to walk down the aisle, right, I don't want to see. I don't want to see you. 
and then some fuckhead behind you holding your dress up. Because I know myself. I know that I'll see the beautiful woman that I'm marrying and I'll be like, God, I love her. This is the best day of my life. And then I'll look down at the spastic six-year-old who can't even walk properly for himself, let alone hold the trail of my wife's dress. And I'll go, why the fuck are you here? Get out of the way. I don't want you. I don't want, I want to look at this bitch. I don't want to look at you. I already know that would ruin my experience. Where are we? Where's the schedule? All right. Um, what's the fucking time? Just, the couple will marry at 1pm midday, man. All right. So it doesn't have the action, whatever. The thing, no shit. I got home at 8pm. It was still going. When I left at like 11, and when I arrived, they were halfway through. So I think the thing went for like, at least five hours man that's way too long for any kind of event anything that's way too long for anything could you ever can you name one thing that you can enjoy for five hours with someone else so like i could play video games for five hours for sure i could you know watch tv but that's all like by myself i'm talking about organizing lots of different people friends family and putting them in a room for five hours like, dude, a five-hour orgy, I couldn't enjoy. Mainly because your family would be there. But, <laughs> like, five hours, dude, of sitting in a fucking church, no matter how beautiful it is. At some point, you'd, you'd walk in initially, and you'd be like, wow, amazing. But then I feel like I would just start, look, like, after hour two, I would have looked at every single glass, 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 glass. What have I got a fucking lisp? I would look at every single glass panel in that fucking building and then I would just start thinking. Actually, I thought this in two minutes of watching the thing on TV. I was like, how many peasants died to build that? Huh? How many how many how many people with families and kids didn't come home because the royals told them to Oi, build this fucking building for the cunt in the sky, eh? I, I mean I'm not gonna pay you for it, so just do it. Also, you're probably going to die, and so will all your mates. But I really want this building later. I think that's what shits me about the Royals, is they're just... They're just... Regular cunts... That were lucky enough to be formed in the right ball sack. You know what I mean? Like, at least Meghan Markle has done something... She's done shit. She's a famous actor, and she was in Suits. She's and she she's done shit, you know. But this fucking ranger, Prince Harry, was just born. Oh wow, she gets to marry a prince, really? Like I don't understand. And and here's the thing: it's all women who give a fuck about this shit. Oh, it's all women. I haven't met a single man that was like, oh, the royal wedding was sick. It's all women because it goes back to that little primal thing in their, in everyone's brain that goes, in women's brains that goes, gee, I'd like to just never do anything ever again and live in a palace. That'd be nice. It's like, I don't understand why the fuck she would want to marry into the royal family or any person would it'd be the worst you just have to give up on your dreams and become just a regular cunt but the problem is you are surrounded 24 7 by security and paparazzi pretending like they give a fuck if you break protocol that was made 200 years ago Like, dude, I, I think I read some article for the radio show. We were looking at the dumbest radio articles, we, the dumbest royal articles we could find. And there was one that there was apparently there's some outrage because Meghan Markle didn't curtsy to the Queen when she walked past her. 
it's like, dude, that's her mother-in-law. She probably... F- no, that's her grandmother-in-law, meaning she probably fucking hates the bitch. <laughs> that would be like me curtsying to Jasmine's grandma. No. Sorry, she's a lovely lady, but am I going to curtsy? No. Well, I suppose I would bow. Maybe I would curtsy just to fuck with the press. That's what I would do, man. You know what? I take it all back. I want to marry into the royal family and then just start enacting really old laws. that are, You know the laws that are still there, but they never got rid of them? I would just start enacting that shit. Like, hey! I'm the, I'm the fucking Duke of... I'm the Duke of Wellington Berry. And this law from 1884... Says that I get to fuck the Prime Minister's wife whenever I want. So, give her up. And I would do that live on TV. I'd call a press conference. I'd be like, I call upon the law of 1854 that states the Duke of Wellington Berry may at any point and any time of his choosing have sexual intercourse with the Prime Minister's wife at any time, upon any surface, vigorously and lengthily. And then I would just walk off the TV set, and then I just wouldn't fuck her. (laughs) I would just do the press conference. And then they'd hand her over and I'd be like, I don't want to fuck her, send her back. Just to mess with the public. So you'd have that initial headline thing of, oh, is the Prime Minister gonna get gonna let the Duke of Wellington bury fuck his wife? And then there'll be a big debate, and like the Conservatives will be like, Well, I respect the royal tradition and I really do think that the Duke of Wellington Berry should be allowed to fuck the Prime Minister's wife. And then on the left the people will be like, But she's not an object, man. Like, she should have free will and and free choice. I mean, I'm not saying that open relationships are bad. I'm just saying, maybe the Duke of Wellington Berry isn't entitled to the Prime Minister's Minister's wife's pussy just because that was in a law in 1854. And then the Prime Minister would just have to come and, like, deliver her to my house like she was some Nando's ordered on Uber Eats. Like, she... He'd have to... I would would also add on... And... She must be delivered to me in an Uber Eats bag. You know, with the staples, so I know that she hasn't been tampered with. And she, like, he gives me a giant Uber Eats bag, and I open it. And then I see she's in there, like, like in some lingerie. And then I just look at him, and I go, Mmm. Now nah, send it back. You're going to have her. And, and then you have the second round. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I don't understand this fucking royal shit. It's just like a it's like a bunch of people that were born out of the right pussy, so we have to revere them. You know what it is? It's all a giant tourism ad. That's li- that's literally what it fucking is at this point, because they have no control over England. And no one would ever like no one would actually listen to them. If the Queen was like, hey, I think we should go to war with these people. No one would actually fucking listen. They don't actually have power. They're there as a giant tourism ad. Hey, come and see the fucking corrupt feudal system that was brought about because everyone fucked their cousin and killed the competition. Check that out. It's pretty cool, huh? I don't know. Yo, did you see, um... Did you see Spotify just taking down R. Kelly and uh, who's that? Uh, who's that fucking emo retard that shaved off his eyebrows so he looks like and bleached his hair so he looks like anime anime black boo? Triple <laughs> uh, X Tentacion, that cunt, the dude who beat up beat up the pregnant chick. You see, Spotify take, like, R. Kelly and all of these other people accused and guilty of sexual assault uh, against women off their featured playlists. And then, and then, that, I, that was dumb. I, like, I, here's the thing. 
obviously shouldn't promote people that beat the fuck out of women. However, that's also like 99% of the music industry is people who either treat women like shit or talk about treating women like shit. Like, that's rap. And I feel like Spotify, it was a dumb decision for them because now they've opened the floodgates of if they're going to take people down for, like, abusing women or being violent against women, now they're going to be... Ex- pe- when If someone goes to jail for hurting a man or for dealing drugs or for saying something fucked up, it's just opened the floodgates to be like, hey, man, you took off R. Kelly for pissing on some minors why aren't you going to take away 50 Cent for being implicated in uh, a murder? Do you guys remember where when 50 Cent got shot and then he wrote an entire song about how he organized the people who shot him to be murdered and those people are now dead? <laughs> Do you guys... I mean, I'm saying it's the one of the greatest rap songs of all time, but he says in the song, this guy is dead after he shot me, ha ha, like, that's the song, I got shot, but I killed this cunt, that's that song, and he's still on Spotify playlists, or like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, have you read Anthony Kiedis' book, that fucking, what's it called, it's called like, I don't know, Anthony Kiedis' book, Scar tissue. Have you read that book, man? Very similar to every song the Red Hot Chili Peppers has ever written. That book is just a diary of all the girls he fucked. Oh, also, I was taking heroin at the time. That's the book. I fucked a lot of girls and did heaps of heroin. The book. In that book, Red Hot Chili Peppers, one of the greatest bands of all time. I don't want any of you guys to... to uh, shoot, to. I don't want you guys to think that I'm saying any of these musicians or artists that I'm talking about are bad. They're all brilliant, and this is my point. Anthony Kiedis, in his book, tells a story about how he was fucking this beautiful girl and then finds out that she's 15 years old. Then fucks her again. Then... Drives her to school. He wrote that in a book, man. And everyone's like, what an amazing book. The Red Hot Chili Peppers are amazing. Anthony Kiedis, by his own admission, is a pedophile. (laughs) And everyone's like, woo, sweet. Woohoo. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Blood sugar sex magic. Like, that's what I'm saying is, if you start taking musicians off of playlists and shit that have done bad things, you're essentially, <laughs> you're essentially going to have to blacklist 99% of rappers and just about every rock star. Or maybe what I'm saying is, anyone who isn't a woman is an evil motherfucker if they know how to play an instrument. Because that's why they picked it up. Like, that's why 90% of men learn how to play guitar. They don't, like, they play guitar just good enough to get a girl a little bit wet at a house party and then, you know, take advantage of it. That's the kind of guy that brings a guitar to a party. Is the dude who brings a guitar, he learns how to play Wonderwall, he plays it for a couple of girls, and then he picks the most vulnerable, takes her around the alley to a park, fingers her, and then she loses consciousness. That's the type of guy who brings a guitar to a party. Now imagine that guy keeps doing this to girls so often that he inadvertently gets really good at the guitar, and then he starts a band called the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and all of a sudden, that house party is now expanded to the world. And instead of getting a couple vulnerable 19-year-old girls (laughs) 
<laughs> into compromising position. He's now got that little pool expanded to every vulnerable 19-year-old girl in the world. Even if she doesn't speak English. That's the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I'm not saying that they're not a good band. Phenomenal band. I love all of their music. But I am saying Anthony Kiedis fucked a 15-year-old, found out that she was 15, fucked her again, and then drove her to school. That's all that I'm saying. So, you know, maybe think about that the next time you hear a funky bass line. Oh, man. Dude, Anthony Kiedis, have you seen what he looks like now? That cunt is 55, and he's got a bowl cut and a mustache. He finally looks like the pedophile that he always was. <laughs> oh. Man, what else do I want to talk about today? Oh, dude, I saw the um, I saw the the second Deadpool movie. Uh, this weekend, and holy shit. That's all I said. Holy fuck, what a good movie. That's one of the best movies I've ever seen, and the last time I saw a film that left me with this holy shit best movie ever seen, was the last Deadpool movie. And it's not because I'm a Marvel nerd either. Like, I've seen plenty of Marvel movies and left the cinema going, ugh, I, I, it was alright, it was another Marvel movie. The Deadpool movie was phenomenal, man. Actually, one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. Like, right up there with the first Hangover. Because the first Hangover, dude, that's an underrated film. That changed comedy. Comedy films. Like, The Hangover spurred all of these fucking wild, night gone wrong video films. Like, The Hangover spurned Hot Tub Love Machine and fucking, uh... Bridesmaids and, and all of these... Any, any movie where there's three or more people and their friends and they go somewhere and shit goes wrong, the ha that's the hangover wave that everyone wrote. It's kind of dying off now. But Deadpool 2 was full-on hilarious, man. I've ne I haven't heard... It was like a stand-up comedy show. It was weird. No matter what was happening, as soon as Deadpool came on the screen, people were like listening to what he said because everything he said was uh, a joke. It wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't any, like, funny scenes or funny things didn't happen. It was all dialogue. It was just brilliant writing and everything that each character said was fucking funny. Or another character made it funny, but they still managed to uh, have an intriguing storyline that carried the whole thing from start to end. I don't know. I'm kind of raving about it, but I got invited to the premiere and I didn't have high hopes because it was the second movie, but... It was just a really genuinely good movie. I don't have any bad things to say about it. I'm actually going to see it again this week, maybe one time after the show. Because, um, yeah, it was really, really good. Um, yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't have anything uh, interesting to say about that. Other than, you know what was funny? At these fucking premieres, I got invited to it by email. And they sent me, oh my god, they sent me some fucking, this PR company reaches out to me and they're like, hey, we're handling the PR promotion for the Deadpool V energy drink collaboration, whatever the fuck, we'd like your address so we can send you something special. And I was like, alright, checked them up, made sure they were legit, I gave them a phone call, and I was like, okay, here it is, send me some shit, and they sent me some fucking, uh, it was like a motivational book written by Deadpool, but then you open the book, and it was all of, it was like a huge, like, maybe seven, five, five hundred page book, like a big hardcover book, and then inside the book, there was no, there was a bunch of pages, but there was nothing written on the pages, and there was a little cutout, and there was a V energy drink can in the book, it's like, hey, V energy makes you a little bit better, and that was kind of cool, for like the first second, like I, I was like, oh man, Deadpool wrote a whole, the, the marketing team for Deadpool wrote a whole book. I can't wait to read this. And then, oh, it's a, it's a can of V. That's, I get, I get it. That's uh, marketing. And then I was like, how many fucking trees died? <laughs> how many fucking trees died to create that like six out of 10 V ad? 
I heard they printed 500 books to do that shit. It's like, dude, you're already destroying the environment by having that little fucking aluminium can floating around the ocean forever. You didn't also have to chop down a 300 year old tree. Just send me a V. That's all. I don't need your book. <laughs> all those movie premieres are fucking weird, man. I don't like... I don't know. I don't, I don't like being treated like a special person. It's weird. We go to this premiere, me and my girl, and you get there, and it's like the complete opposite of what a movie cinema is. It's like four premieres... Where, I don't know, people of note are supposed to attend. I suppose I, I, I went because now I'm talking about the movie, right? That's why I got invited. But you get treated like you probably should be treated when you go to a cinema normally. But because you get treated like shit when you go to a cinema, <laughs> them treating you with respect feels special. <laughs> um, so you get there and there's like this fucking... Um, line of people going welcome to the deadpool movie thanks for coming i'm like all right this is fucking weird oh the only thing that was special was they gave you free popcorn and drinks and it, they, like that's nuts because normally i'm used to paying 18 dollars for popcorn and by paying for it i mean looking at the price of popcorn and going i'm i'm not going to do that and i'll go in by myself i'm going to get something from coles that's like 50 meters down there for a, a quarter of the price and then sneak it in but yeah they gave us free popcorn and that was that i felt like i felt like i won the lottery because that's just the opposite of what movie cinemas do um but yeah deadpool was good i'm gonna go see it again uh probably this week sometime um what else did i want to talk about today um Oh, yeah, I don't have any segues for all of the shit that I want to talk about today. I'm just going to look at my notes. Man, I got I got hit on in the weirdest way. I don't get hit on very often, guys. I know this might, this might surprise you, but every now and then it happens. And, uh, fuck, man, this is a weird one. So I'm walking through the city. I'm wearing my leather jacket. I was going somewhere else, so I looked nice. Like, I had dressed up. So I was looking good, and I'm going down the street and then I just stopped outside this cafe or some food place to look at their menu and as I'm reading the menu some girl gorgeous girl walks up to me and she starts talking to me and immediately when someone who's fucking beautiful starts talking to me I'm like why <laughs> I'm like I don't know I don't, what do I what am I gonna do for you okay and she was real short she was like maybe five three and I, I'm, I, and she starts talking to me and like real friendly talking. She touched my arm and I'm like, you know, when I suppose girls would, would girls, you would know within half a second when someone's hitting on you, because I guess it happens so much more often than men. But when a guy gets hit on by a girl that they don't know, it takes us like two minutes to be like. Hang on, is, is it, why is this girl being so nice to me? Why is this girl giving me the time of day? This is weird. What's wrong with this girl? So she starts talking to me, being real nice and standing close. And I'm like, what? Uh, yeah. Uh, she goes, hey, what's your name? I'm like, my name's Lewis. And at first I thought she was a fan, but she had no idea who I was. So she's talking to me. And I'm like, yep, yeah, okay. I get her name. And she just touches my arm. And I'm like, ooh. I think I'm, I think I'm getting hit on here. I could be getting hit on here. I'm not really sure. She touches my arm and then I said something shit and she giggled and she went, ha ha. And she touched my arm again. And I was like, we're fucking on boys. I gotta, I gotta put up a wall here before I cheat on my girlfriend. But she starts talking to me and, and just as I'm about to walk away, she goes, oh, how tall are you? You're so tall. And I was like, oh fuck, here we go. Because I get this every fucking day. So I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm six foot eight. And she goes, and she was a little bit foreign. She, she was a backpacker. Which, and every time. 
for some reason, the moment a girl is out of her home country, she is like, I am not where I live. It's time for some fucking dick. Yee-hoo! Bro, you ever meet... If, if you talk to a backpacking girl for more than three minutes, you could probably sleep with her. Like that, for some reason, as soon as a girl leaves her home country, she's like, my reputation doesn't exist, and any kind of reputation I attain in this country isn't going to follow me home, so let's start up the train, I'm going to get fucked. <laughs> so anyway, this girl, she starts talking to me, hitting on me. She asked me, she's like, oh, how tall are you? And I'm like, uh, I'm six foot eight. And guys, if you were skeptical about me getting hit on, I'm about to, I'm about to shatter your illusions. You're about to be on my fucking team. So she goes, oh, you're, wow, you're so tall. That's great. I'm only five foot three. And I was like, yeah, you're pretty small. And she goes, you could spit on my head. (laughs) And I'm like, uh, what? She goes, yeah, from up there, you could spit on my head. And I was like, (laughs) I just went, yeah, I I could. I don't know. I've never thought of that before. She goes, yeah, because I'm so small and you're so tall. And yes, it's kind of cool, isn't it? And then I just went, I mean, yeah, I could, but I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you. That'd be very rude. And she's like, she's, and she goes, it's not rude if I'm into it. And I was like, all right, well, I don't really want to spit on strangers in the street. And she goes, we don't have to do it in the street. I'm like, no, I'm fucking out. I am out of here. I am not going to go to a fucking hostel to spit on the top of some girl's head that I've just met. And I was like, hey, um, I'm sorry. I really got to go. And I go to walk away and she grabs onto my arm and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know what you what you thought you were trying to go for here, but I'm not really interested. Have a lovely day. I, fi- I hope you find what you're after. And I walked away like, fuck. I think that's one of the only times that I've been like overtly hit on. I mean, like it's happened after comedy shows, but it's never happened like in the street. That's probably the only time like in public when someone doesn't know I'm a performer, like a normal thing. Where I've been fucking real, really hit on. I think oh, only other, only it was only one other time, and it was a backpacker as well. It was one other time. This was years. Oh no, it was this year. Fuck! What have I, what have I been doing this year? All these fucking backpackers are hitting on me. Jeez, the and I was wearing the jacket. It must be the jacket. You know what? You you, you buy a fucking leather bikey jacket, and all of a sudden, girls from foreign countries with awful fathers are just like attract to you like like it's a fucking mosquito magnet so i remember it was at brunswick hotel i was doing funny at the brunny i was about to perform in like 20 minutes so i'm sitting at uh in the outside area which is like a public space where normally people are just drinking and i'm writing in my notepad and i was by myself uh just writing jokes that I'm about to go up and tell. And this girl sits opposite to me at the table. She's foreign. I don't know where she's from. Some European country. Again, quite a pretty girl. And she she goes, Hi, what's your name? I'm like, oh. And I'm not really, I'm not paying attention to her. I'm like, oh, my name's Lewis. Writing some shit down. And then she goes, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just writing some stuff. And she goes, oh, wow. Are you a writer? Are you writing poems? And I'm like, oh my God. You Immediately in my head, I was like, I know what you've done, you poor girl. You've seen some cunt at like 10 p.m. on a Monday in a leather jacket writing notes in a pad. And you think you found like William Shakespeare. (laughs) You think you found some tragic chain smoking modern William Shakespeare who's just trying to get a poem book published and he's got so many dark feelings and he rides a motorcycle and he's never let anyone close to his heart. But maybe, just maybe, you could be the girl to distract him from his depressing poems and he'll chase you for once instead of running away from his own feelings. But then, because you will have to move back to your home country, he'll follow you 
writing poems about your love all the way. Like, just talking to her, I know she's just written a narrative in her, in her head about who I was and how she would incorporate into my beautiful but tragic story. And I'm like, oh no, I'm a, I'm a comedian. And immediately, disappointment. Like, dude, and I was offended. I was like, hey, a comedian is such a more viable choice than a poem. Poem? Mist? Poemist? Poem writer? What's the word? Poet. <laughs> that, like, a comedian is not a viable career choice. But at least it's more viable than a fucking poet. Like, come on. Don't look down. Don't be disappointed because I tell jokes instead of write about fucking pedals like every other cunt's already done before. I got real offended. But she was still, she still starts talking to me. She puts her hand on my fucking arm, which I hate. Don't, don't touch me. Don't touch me, bitch. So she puts her fucking hand on my arm and she's like, what are you writing about? And I'm like, oh, I'm just jokes about. I can't remember what I was writing about. I said something. She was like, oh, that's funny. And then she goes, um, <clears throat> she brings her friend over and she goes, oh, this is my friend, whatever. Another pretty girl. And now they're both sitting opposite to me. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? And she goes, this is my friend. And and I'm like, oh, where are you guys from? She goes, oh, uh, we are from Germany, blah, blah, blah. And she's got this accent. And I was like, oh, I speak a little bit a little bit of German. She's like, oh, sprechen Sie Deutsch? And I was like, yeah, genau. Uh, meine Geburtstag ist am 16. Januar. Which just means my birthday is the 16th of January, I think, anyway. Uh, and then they laughed. And she goes, oh, not very good. Um... But then she just goes, she just starts talking about this apartment that they're staying at down the road. She's like, yeah, me and my friend, we're staying in an apartment. It's just us. And, you know, we're, we're, we've got some music up there. And I was, and I'm just like, hang on a second. Is this bitch trying to get me to come to an apartment? Either I'm going to get a threesome or murdered out of this. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm going to get on stage in a little bit. So I can't come. Sorry. And she's like, oh, no, that's okay. We'll stay and watch you perform. And then I was like, uh, all right. But uh, then I got to go home. She's like, that's okay. Maybe we can convince you otherwise. And I was like, fucking sick. The one time in my life I get an opportunity for a threesome. I'm in a, I'm in a wonderfully fulfilling relationship. I'm like, fuck. This is what every cunt dreams of. And I can't enact on this wonderful opportunity because I'm a good boyfriend. Whatever. So I go up and I perform. And I'm, I'm working on this bit about, uh, about straight white women hating on straight white men, but they don't realize that we're on the same team. It's basically this whole thing about feminism and, and turning the audience, starting, starting the audience against me and then turning them on my side and against feminism. It's this whole big fucking thing. Um, but it was in its early stages. And when, when my jokes are in its early stages, I basically have my most offensive points and then a couple of jokes. <laughs> like, it's going really well now. Now that we're closer to the tour, it's killing now. But whenever I start a joke, it's like, Hey, incredibly offensive opinion. Not too many jokes to pad that one out for you. Hope you enjoy. This is more for me than it is for you. This is a learning experience, not a performance for you. So I do that bit. And uh, then I get off stage and uh, they just gave me filthy looks and left. So, uh, hey guys, I don't mean to brag, but my jokes are so good that they will uh, destroy my chance at a threesome. <laughs> That I wouldn't have taken them up on anyway. I was planning on saying thank you, ladies, but no thank you. Go and lick your pussies by yourself. You don't need me. I'm not. I'm not going to add to the experience. You guys are way too beautiful for me to be involved. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Oh yeah, the warehouse. Right. So, uh, where were we? I was going to go and inspect it. 
And I've inspected the warehouse and it's fucking perfect. It's everything that I need. It's 50 meters squared and it's like really, really high. So there's storage space up top. I could fit about five different film spaces there and I don't need five different film spaces. I could fit editing bays, merchandise spaces, storage, film sets, live streaming areas. Everything I will ever need to create this little video production studio that I'm trying to build will fit in that website it's warehouse. It's 10 minutes down the road from me, easily accessible by public transport for the moment while I get my driver's license uh, and and uh, free parking out the front while when I do have my license in a fucking decade at the rate I'm going. It's fucking perfect. I inspected it. It's beautiful. But I can't afford it. I don't know. I can't afford I can't afford it. I can't afford the fucking warehouse. Um, so I'm doing the numbers. I've been that's why I've been going to Bunnings so much is I've been going to Bunnings with my girl to try and figure out how much money would it actually cost me to set up a really bare bones uh, thing in the meantime because the thing with uh, with how my money's working at the moment is I haven't toured because I moved my tour six months later because I want to tour in September instead of April and May like I have been doing for the last three years. Year four is in April, May. That means the income that I count on that comes in generally every 12 months, this year, I've had to wait 18 months for. So I'm at like the end. I'm at the very end where if I don't fucking be careful with this, I'm going straight down from jeans money to t-shirt money to fun money to food money to no food buddy. Like that. It'll be like that. So I don't know. I'm crunching the numbers. At the moment, I can't afford it. I'm going to try and figure out a way to do it because, like I said, it's fucking perfect. And if I can get it to a point where I can just, I don't know, maybe lease it for the first month and then, you know, pump out videos and, and push Patreon heaps, maybe I'll become good. But at the moment, I don't know. I'm, I, need, I need to have a real, real solid think about what I'm going to do. Um, but if I can do it, I will. But at the moment, I just don't know. But I do know that it's fucking perfect. I just need to figure out how to do it and what and, and how to get there. Um, but hopefully, I think I'm going to know by next week. Because really, if if I don't do it by next week, the guy's just going to be like, Hey man, I'm just going to give it to, to someone else. Like, he's holding it for me. But we'll see. We'll fucking see. So, um, hey, oh, also, by the way, thanks to the few people who did jump on Patreon after I talked about it the first time, that that gave me a little bit to think about because originally I was like, oh, I can't really fucking rely on shit. But but then a whole after I talked about it the first time, a few of you guys jumped on Patreon and said, hey, I'm doing this so you can get the warehouse. And that gives me faith of, oh, maybe if I just get the thing and then tell you guys, Patreon will jump up. And also with the video output jumping up, because of course it would, because I have a fucking space to record. I don't know. Basically, it might just have to be a leap of faith thing where I commit to something I can't afford and then because I've done that, I will be able to. I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. Or I'll just have to be like, no, nah, I can't afford it until fucking next year, which was the plan. So we'll see, guys. We'll fucking see. Either way, I'm not going to spit on that girl's head. <laughs> All right. With that being said, I'm going to get into miscellaneous bit at the end, and then we'll wrap this shit up. Right, I've been going on for a bit long, so we've just got time for one email. If you would like to send an email to uh, miscellaneous bit at the end for me to answer, if you have any life advice, questions, or stories you think I would like, I would love to hear them. Podcast at loosespears.com is the email. That is podcast at loosespears.com. All right, so send an email in. I'm actually running a little bit low on uh, on questions, so if you have something... Uh, send it through. All right. I'm Nick. I'm having girlfriend issues. Hey, Lewis. I'm in a relatively normal, committed relationship. Our relationship is going pretty well. We love each other and all that other shit. The problem is she's always upset about something. She's going through a tough time at home with her mum being slightly suicidal. That's rough. 
Uh, and obviously, all the other stuff that comes with that. Yeah. My girlfriend is also going through a hard time at uni with a two-hour commute and a big workload that she constantly procrastinates and does not do. All of this leads to a constant stream of conversations about depressing stuff. Yeah. Uh, some of it uh, she puts on herself, like the uni work procrastination and other things she can't help, like getting headaches and telling me when she has them constantly and her mum being pretty terrible and, un and unfair to her. It all creates a depressing, depressing relationship where we are happy with each other, but she can't find happiness in her personal life. I feel like I'm getting the blunt end of a stick constantly having to try and be the uplifting motivator and getting not much or very little in return. I don't want to break up with her because that would add one more shit thing that happens to her, but staying with her is mentally draining. What should I do? Uh, P.S. <laughs> P.S. People listening to the podcast should go support Lewis on Patreon and join the lit Facebook chat. Oh, yeah, this guy's on Patreon. Hey, Nick. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, look. That's a, that's a hard thing, man, because I've always said that a relationship only works if two people that are okay by themselves and succeeding on their own and in their own lives come together. I feel like that's the only time if one person isn't happy by themselves or cannot be happy without leaning heavily on someone who is, that's going to create an unhealthy relationship because, I mean, that sounds like what this is what's happening to you, Nick. But that being said, obviously, the main problem, which is her family, is not her fault. I mean, her procrastinating with uni work, that's 100% her, but maybe that's a symptom of dealing with all this horrible shit at home. So I think, really, Nick, you cannot help her. You can't fix her life. No one can fix someone else's life. But you can encourage them to pursue avenues that will help them fix it. And I think that's your responsibility as a partner. You can't just abandon someone because they have a shit time. And this has happened with my relationship where, uh, you know, my girl's going through a, a rough time and it, and it has been shit being the person that's constantly uplifting, constantly motivating, but also you owe it to that person because you know what they're like when they become happy and you can help them get out of it. You can't do it for them. And I would suggest... I suppose, Nick, what it comes down to is you need to encourage her to do things like go to a therapist, talk to people, uh, try and solve her problems, figure out other avenues. If she's having headaches and stuff, get her to see a doctor. You can't fucking help her with that and she can't fix it for herself. Get her to see a doctor about that and then get her to see a therapist about her mum uh, and about her family, which sounds like it'll. if her mum's suicidal, it will almost always be shit and always be something that you have to deal with and and that's sorry that she has to deal with and you have to help her work through but it's also something that she can see a therapist to learn ways to cope with that stress and i would say if you are encouraging her in a positive and healthy way to pursue uh uh professional help and she doesn't want to do that, and she will not work towards it, and she's content to sit in her shit life where she doesn't like it, but she won't fix it, that's when you need to make the decision, am I going to be with someone who won't help themselves and just leans on me? Because that's easy to do, man. If you're having a shit time where you've, you're, you're depressed or stressed or whatever the fuck, it's a really quick situation. It's a really quick solution to just lean on your partner and be like hey i've got problems enjoy these because it makes you feel better for like a day or the day that you're with them but then they leave and you're stuck with it so i feel like it's easy and a lot of relationships do that where they're like oh i don't have to deal with my fucking problems because when i see my boyfriend it makes me a little bit happy or when i see my girlfriend they make me forget about my problems but that doesn't mean they disappear and Sounds like her family stuff will never disappear. It's her mum. And her mum's suicidal. Of course that's going to fuck with her head. 
but she can learn coping methods from professionals and talk about it with a therapist who can help her learn that. So I would say encourage her to pursue other avenues of professional help. And if she flat out refuses to do it after a reasonable uh, effort from you to convince her, that's when you may need to make the decision of, am I going to be with someone who won't even help themselves? Uh, And I would say, generally the answer is, that's not your problem or your responsibility to be the short-term fix for someone else's happiness. All right? So, Nick, encourage her to get some help. If she flat out refuses beyond all reasonable doubt, dump her because that will only make you sad and stop you from being able to find someone who you can celebrate life with. And and also, it means if they're life is fucked and you're always the person to fix them, you're fucked if something happens to you. Or even something small. If you get frustrated at work, you don't want to tell her because she's sad about her mum almost killing herself every fucking Friday night. So that's what I would say, Nick, is uh, encourage her to find some proper help if she won't think about ending it. Not your life or her mum's, but the relationship. (laughs) All right, guys. That's the end of the episode. Um, Next Sunday, I will have a definitive answer for you guys, I think, about the warehouse and whether or not I'm going to do it because I have to tell the guy. All right? So, I don't know. At the moment, can't afford it. Hopefully, I'll be able to work something out or, or I'll just take the leap of faith and trust you guys yet again. But I feel like <laughs> I've done that so many times. One of these days, it'll bite me in the ass. But it hasn't so far and you guys have for the most part, I mean, for 100% of every time I've done it, have got my back and made sure that it's been a success and it's worked out. So, uh, I don't know. Um, so, also, check out the, the radio show. We're posting full clips of uh, Luke and Lewis shows, the entire show in its 40-minute entirety, without any ads and no music. Uh, I think it's really cool, and we're the only radio show doing that. So check that out, and if you want to support me on Patreon, that's how we do all of this shit and, and pay people to help us. So uh, search Lewis Spears Patreon if you want to contribute to all of that stuff. So that's the end of the episode. I'm going to talk to you guys next Sunday. Uh, until then, I'll be thinking about this fucking warehouse, and you must be having a fucking shit one, because I command it. All right, talk to you next Sunday. Ah, uh, also, post-podcast message. I forgot to say this. Uh, I just noticed while I was editing um, the, and uploading. Thank you very much to everyone who sent some lovely stuff about my dog. It was really nice to read, and it made me feel a lot better. And I'm, I'm fine now. I'm totally fine. We had him cremated, and uh, we got the, the little box with him in it. And it, it's nice, man. It's like he, uh, it's like he came home. Uh, my mum always used to kiss the dog with lipstick on, on his head, and he would always have lipstick on it. And she's done that to the box, which is which is pretty funny. So um, yeah, I, I I think I've I've moved on from the sad period, and now I'm just happy that uh, that I got him. So thank you very much to everyone who sent me lovely messages and and stories about their dogs, and I I'm, I I, uh, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much, and I'm totally fine. I, I feel really good. It's like I said, man. It's like he came home, and now we can just kind of celebrate the memories. So uh, I feel great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, but still, still have a shit one. I'm, I'm serious about that. I command you to have the shittest one of all time. All right, see ya.